Thank you for joining us. This is an InfoWars.com special report on August 30th, 2011. We've got several guests joining us coming up, but first, the news. Well, next stop for NATO. They're announcing that indeed they've been financing the rebels in Syria, just like they financed the rebels in Libya. And there's talk of blockades, embargoes, and perhaps even air bombardments of the nation of Syria. On top of that, Congressman Ron Paul has come out and said, look, you've already caused a giant quagmire in Libya. No doubt uh, that Muammar Gaddafi was an unsavory character, but now you're simply creating a power vacuum that brings in even more dangerous elements. Quote, Gaddafi may well have been a tyrant, but as such, he was no worse than many others that we support and count as allies. We see a pattern of relatively secular leaders in the Arab world being targeted for regime change with the resulting power vacuum being filled by much more radical elements. And that's what we'll be talking to Pepe Escobar, writer for Asia Times, who's been in the Middle East and North Africa. And he's got the article out, How Al-Qaeda Got to Rule Tripoli. Again, that is coming up, a in-depth look at that situation. Also, negative view of federal government hits new high. The federal government is at an all-time historical low with credibility with the American people. And why is that happening? Well, you've got the federal government um, pushing the states and, and also in D.C. raiding people that are having lemonade stands. You have young children being fined or even adults being arrested. We have federal uh, regulations coming into force that seek to um, restrict people having gardens in their own yards. And Gibson Guitars has now been raided. And we've now learned it wasn't over illegal foreign wood. It was over, quote, labor practices because under U.N., uh, Agenda 21 international law, you can't import wood and then work the wood or make any changes to it, continuing uh, with other reasons that the federal government is so incredibly unpopular. We have an article at Infowars.com today that quotes Coin World, as well as the U.S. Secret Service and Department of Justice. And in that report, Feds may seize liberty dollars. And they go on in the report to say that the owner who is awaiting sentencing after his conviction uh, is a, quote, unique type of terrorist because they seek to undermine our democratic form of government when it's the Federal Reserve uh, that in actuality has been doing that all along. And the Secret Service, this is the big new development here, is saying that they may raid people that actually own silver and gold coins that they got from the Liberty Dollar. An incredible new development on that front. Continuing with news, yesterday we interviewed Mike Adams of Natural News, the Health Ranger, and he compiled an extensive report, Natural News Exposes Secret Vaccine Industry Ties and Military Involvement with Institute of Medicine, Reveals Fatal Conflicts of interest. And we've now learned that the Institute of Medicine claims they're not federally funded, but 64% of their funding comes from the federal government. But the private funding comes from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and others. And don't forget who else. That's right, McDonald's. So we weren't surprised today when we received and made phone calls and confirmed that all over North Texas and Dallas and Fort Worth, when you get the little paper sheet that is in the bottom of the McDonald's tray with your hamburger and cheeseburger, it's got all these messages about how important it is to vaccinate. And where it says immunize means healthy lives, little heart over the eye, so you know it's good for you. And Rick Perry, the presidential candidate, of course, here in Texas, engaged in a mass criminal hoax and told the world it was the law to take the deadly Gardasil vaccine that had killed people in trials. So this is par for the course for the state of Texas. But remember, uh, McDonald's did not tell anybody that they're part of this pro-vaccine propaganda arm, the Institute of Medicine. Well, that's it for the news brief here at the start of the transmission. We're going to come back from break and go to uh, a reporter from the Asia Times, Pepe Escobar, 
uh, who has lived all over the world, interviewed uh, the heads of the Northern Alliance and many others, and who has the inside scoop on Al-Qaeda being handed control of Libya by NATO and the U.S. government. Please stay with us. It's InfoWars.com. Special report. You don't need me to tell you that humanity is in a deep crisis. Everyone can feel it. We know a tectonic struggle is now taking place against the forces of freedom and those who love darkness, bondage, and enslavement. Yes, my friends, evil is rising. But take heart, for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. Recently, New World Order operative Hillary Clinton admitted they're losing the info war. We are in an information war, and we are losing that war. The globalists are scared. They've overreached. The future of the info war is in your hands. Join PrisonPlanet.tv, download the thousands of special video reports, ebooks, and more, and get them out to everyone you know. Continue to spread the word about the broadcast on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and every other globalist propaganda platform. We are going to use their system against them. The Info War now goes into high gear. We are back. You're watching an InfoWars.com special report. We're about to interview a very interesting gentleman. He's a journalist. He's an author. He's also an extreme traveler. Uh, he interviewed the head of the Northern Alliance just weeks before he was killed. Uh, he was inside Afghanistan right before 9-11. He is journalist Pepe Escobar and his book, Globalism, how the globalized world is dissolving into liquid war is an absolute must read. Pepe, thank you so much for joining us. Great talking to you, Alex. Well, you have been reporting for Asia Times uh, that uh, Al-Qaeda has taken over Tripoli and is being handed uh, the nation. The LA Times even admits that the leaders uh, of most of the rebellion uh, are actual jihadi Al-Qaeda fighters. What can you tell us from your decade-plus research? Look, I had to confirm, a lot of us came to this information different ways, of course. Uh, the LA Times, for instance, the Independent in London, Al Sharq al Wasat in the Middle East, and myself, but we got to the same conclusion. The top military guys in Tripoli, in the southwest mountain, southwest of Tripoli, and in Cyrenaica, in Benghazi and Derna, they are all Al-Qaeda linked. This means they were and they are still part of the Libyan Islamic fighting group, L-I-F-G. This is a jihadi organization founded in the 90s to fight against Gaddafi, basically. They wanted to turn, uh, especially Syrianica, eastern part of Libya, into an, an Islamic state and to bring down the central government in Tripoli. Obviously, Gaddafi ha having that absolutely hardcore intelligence service system that he had, they were fought, they had to leave the country, many went to Afghanistan and then to Iraq. That was the case of the famous guy of the moment, Abdul Hakim Belhaj. He trained in Afghanistan in the late 90s, early 2000s. Uh, he was training in a camp north of Kabul. Uh, then after 9-11, he disappeared from Afghanistan. He went to Southeast Asia. He was arrested by the CIA in Malaysia in 2003. He was tortured in Bangkok in one of those uh, extraordinary renditions, uh, special CIA prisons all over the world. There was one in Bangkok. Then he was handed back to Libyan uh, intelligence, Libyan security. And he stayed in Libya for the past six years or so. But in 2010, there was a deal between the Gaddafi government and these guys from the LIFG, especially over 200 terrorists, let's put it this way, 214 to be exact. And they were freed after they wrote a document more than 400 pages long, confessing their sins and saying that jihad was over. And of course, they would start, you know, uh, working with the Gaddafi government. So this happened March 2010, last year. After that, these guys disappeared and they surfaced in Benghazi and in Derna early this year after the first demonstrations in Syrianic in February this year. And some of them are now in military command posts. 
Some were trained by U.S. Special Forces, like the, the Southwestern tribe, Berber tribe contingent that went to Tripoli like uh, eight, nine days ago and took over Tripoli. The military commander was Belhaj, and there were other LIFG guys, Al-Qaeda linked with him. But these guys, they were trained in the Southwest Mountains by U.S. Special Forces, so the U.S. knows exactly who it's dealing with. And everybody, the French intelligence, uh, British SAS, they know they're dealing with these guys. And it's, you, don't, you don't need a PhD in Germany to know there's going to be blowback sooner or later, Alex. Well, certainly, are we going to end up having a new Al-Qaeda base of operations uh, similar to Afghanistan that will then menace Europe, uh, the, the Mediterranean? And is that what the military-industrial complex is looking for? Use their old ally from the Russian war, now against Gaddafi, and then later, a few years down the road, oh, there has to be a new invasion, fresh, fresh meat for the war machine to deal with Al-Qaeda. I mean, this is just like 1984, never at war with East Asia, always at war with East Asia. Always, exactly. No, you're right. Always a war. And uh, this could happen within the next few weeks or months, assuming, which is uh, practically certain, that this uh, hardcore Islamists cannot be part of of a transitional government in, in Libya, or the next government for that matter. In fact, Belhaj last week, one week ago, last Tuesday, he said on the record that he wants Sharia law for Libya. Can you imagine? So, uh, Gaddafi, okay, hardcore, old world, Cold War style dictator. We all know that. But he's a very clever guy as well. From the beginning, he was saying this was an Al Qaeda linked and foreign-based intervention. Well, we know. We know. And he was absolutely right because his intelligence services dealt with these guys on a daily basis and they were imprisoned by the regime. Well, that was my next question because you've been studying this for more than a decade. Um, I remember back in 96, uh, it later came out in the BBC, that the West had tried to use al-Qaeda to kill Gaddafi uh, because Gaddafi was the first person to put an Interpol warrant out for Osama bin Laden. And it turns out now that from the beginning, uh, the rebels were financed by the West, by NATO, by the U.S. Uh, and so what's the end game here? Is there anything legitimate about this revolution in Libya? Or was it what it appears to be the West starting this from the beginning and using al-Qaeda fighters uh, to, to start this? Yes, uh, it's true. There was a, a legitimate component of the so-called uprising. Uh, it, this is a, mo a movement called February 17th movement. A lot of young people, unemployed people, uh, some with uh, good diplomas, by the way, the Google generation living in eastern Libya, they were trying to rise against the regime again. And they had some legitimate demonstrations in early February, mid-February in Benghazi. But then, these demonstrations were hijacked by this uh, compound, this motley crew of uh, Gaddafi defectors, Al-Qaeda Islamists, uh, British Special Forces, the French intelligence, everybody. Because this was the, one of the openings. But it was not an opening itself because the war or the military coup d'etat, if we can put it this way, was concocted last year and guess where? In France. The whole thing started in October 2010. Gaddafi's chief of protocol, a guy called Nuri Mesmari, he defected, he went to Paris, he was approached by French intelligence, he said he was in contact with the uh, hardcore military personnel, especially in Benghazi, but he also had contacts in, uh, in Tripoli with possible defectors. They started to organize what would be a military coup, and they said, look, we need a popular component for all this. The popular component was... Uh, the February 17th movement, because they they start to be instigated by a number of sources. Okay, let's start uh, planning demonstrations for February. So when the demonstrations happened, and in the beginning they were legitimate by these uh, young guys, basically, they were immediately hijacked by the Motley crew. And then we could see the French agenda at play. Uh, I don't know if uh, many people in America may not remember this, but uh, Sarkozy recognized the council from the beginning. In, already in February, one of France's uh, 
most disgusting characters. I happen to know these guys, Bernard Henri Lévy. He's a left bank intellectual, nouveau philosopher and all that. This guy who went to Benghazi, he met with the council. He called Sarkozy from Benghazi and said, look, we need to recognize these people immediately. They are the legitimate government. So Sarkozy, before anybody else, before the UN, before resolution, whatever, recognized these people and start sending French intelligence and you know, covert operation officers to Benghazi to link with these people already there. So this, from the beginning, was a French war. The Americans and the Brits came later. The French and the British redacted the UN Resolution 1973. The Americans came on board because they also saw an opening. But there are so many reasons that Gaddafi was isolated that it, it was impossible. He, he, he reached an end of the line. In fact, I'm writing as we speak a story of what red lines Gaddafi crossed. There were so many. Well, you can go let me, forever lining them up, you know. <laughs> in summation, uh, give me your uh, research take on why this happened. We know he was trying to unify Africa, create their own currency, their own water supply. Yes. He was a dictator, but uh, whether it was because of his arrogance or because he cared, he was building up uh, Libya from a backwater to the most wealthy per capita uh, in Africa. That's why so many African nations are you know, still defending him. So I want you to speak to why they went after him. But then in closing, where is this yes. going to go? We were told this was done because there was a humanitarian disaster with a few protesters being killed uh, because it was confirmed a lot of them were operatives and were violent. I'm not defending what happened. The point is yes. all of them weren't just protesters. Now, most of the country without power, water, uh, we know there are confirmed reprisals against black Libyans. Uh, they're just dragging them out of their houses and killing them. Uh, no doubt the Qaddafi forces are engaged in some uh, uh, some reprisals against uh, people as well, but it's not on a racial uh, issue. So uh, where is this going? I mean, did Europe want to knock uh, this country back into the Stone Age like they did Serbia? Is this the Western powers following that policy of deindustrializing any country that isn't part of Western Europe or the United States? Well, basically, Alex, they want to, Libya has to be sold to the rest of the world as an example. So uh, you don't antagonize uh, the Bank of International Settlements in Switzerland. You don't antagonize the Western bankers. You don't antagonize European corporations or Americans, for that matter. You don't nationalize our oil industry. You don't invest in uh, uh, humanitarian projects in sub-Saharan Africa, as Gaddafi was doing. There is, you mentioned, and there, there is a very strong racial element as well. Libya now is turning... Uh, more into an Arab country, perhaps an Arab emirate, than an African country. Prejudice against blacks in, in Libya is enormous, even before, especially from people uh, in eastern part of Libya, in Cyrenaica. There's a report in The Independent today, my friend Patrick Coburn, one of the best reporters in the world, he talks exactly about racial prejudice from the rebels, let's put it this way, against blacks. And it doesn't matter if they had been living for 10, 15 years with a residence permit, uh, legal job, you know, education. It doesn't matter. They see black, sub-Saharan black Africans in block as mercenaries. This is horrible. The repercussions can be horrendous. So basically, Libya well, I remember you, so you and others warning about this. Webster Tarpley, a journalist, yes. historian, three months ago said that in the East, when they took areas, they were lynching and killing blacks th who just have as much right as anybody to be in Africa. I mean, it's the, it's the African continent, hence the name Africa. And now the Washington Post and others admit, but it's buried, that, yeah, there's big giant piles of dead black people. And they're just taking women, men, you name it, out of their houses and killing them with no proof. And this should be a bigger issue that you've got racial uh, genocide going on or an attempt at it. Yes. And it's not even yes. an issue here. It's true. But, you know, at least it's let, let's put it this way. It's a start when you have a Reuters story or it's in one uh, page 12B or whatever, New York Times or Washington Post, at least now they're talking about it because there were massacres on both sides. And now you, we have to talk about the fact that there have been massacres basic against black Africans, basically committed by people from Eastern Libya. Exactly. Gaddafi's right? people, it's been shown, yeah. are killing personnel that they had yeah. uh, in prisons. And that's wrong and is a war crime. But just to go out and randomly 
have no proof and just kill people is incredible. Pepe Escobar, incredible information in closing from your over a decade traveling around Central Asia, Middle East, covering this, being the first to break a lot of information that turns out to be very accurate later from your sources and studying this. Where is Libya going to end up in six months, a year? Because there's many tribes. They're all in reprisal attacks now. And the country that's been uh, you know, basically built up uh, and industrialized, what's going to happen to this huge population? Look, uh, looking at the facts on the ground and trying to extrapolate in a very realistic manner, we can say that there are a very, there's a very strong possibility of uh, two guerrilla wars in Libya within the next six months. One would be Gaddafi forces against a weak TNC-based government in Tripoli. To answer this question, you must know how many tribes are actually supporting Libya and how many tribes Gaddafi can buy within the next few weeks or months. The second possibility is a guerrilla war by these Al-Qaeda-linked guys, the Islamists, the LIFG people, against NATO in case they are sidelined from power in Tripoli and in case they start viewing pure blowback once again that this is a foreign invasion and we're going to have NATO troops or even if we have troops from the Emirates or from Qatar, they're going to be foreign troops, occupation troops. So you're talking about a triple cross. I'm sorry? You're talking about a triple cross. You, uh, uh, yes. Double tr cross Gaddafi that tried to make deals seven years ago and coming out of the yep. cold and give up his WMDs. Then bring in Al-Qaeda, double cross them again. Yes, absolutely. absolutely. So we're going to have a twin... Uh, guerrilla war against a weak central government, against the NATO or Qatari uh, Emirates occupation forces. We're going to have a tribal war because the tribes who rebelled against Gaddafi, they are still very, very strong tribes that are behind him, including the Warfala tribe, which is the largest in Libya, almost one million people. And Gaddafi's wife, who just was spotted in Algeria yesterday, she belongs to the Warfala tribe. So can you imagine a scenario of tribal civil guerrilla war at the same time in Libya. It's I'm not saying it's going to happen, but it's very possible. Let's talk again in six months. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Pepe Escobar, for joining us. I know you write for Asia Times and, and your book's out. Are, are, are there any sites people should visit to learn more? No, basically Asia Times. I write for Al Jazeera as well, but uh, you can imagine how difficult it is to write for Al Jazeera at the moment. When... Uh, Qatar and uh, Saudi Arabia are involved in a counter-revolution in the Persian Gulf. So it's very really tricky. <laughs> I bet. Yeah, they've certainly been big time involved uh, helping put in propaganda to, to lead to this uh, in uh, Libya. And I tell you, uh, as this thing unravels and unfolds and this humanitarian crisis deepens, we have to all our, uh, ask ourselves uh, this new model of globalization where they go in and fund rebels to go after the central government, then the West comes in and backs them, this is a definitely a, a, a new form of dirty war. And we haven't even talked about NATO's role, Alex. We could go on forever on that as well. Briefly, <laughs> uh, one minute on NATO's Brief role. Uh, because NATO wants the Mediterranean as a NATO lake. This was approved last December in a summit in Lisbon, it's part of the guidelines of NATO for the until 2020. So Libya was out of the grid, just like Syria is. That's why a lot of people who know how NATO works are saying, sooner or later, there's going to be a NATO intervention in Syria. Because Syria has a uh, Russian naval base, and Syria is not part of NATO or not part of any partnership with NATO. NATO wants to control the Mediterranean for the West, uh, more or less recolonize uh, North and Africa, especially now with Libya as a kind of NATO protectorate. And AFRICOM, which is the Pentagon's African command, finally is going to have a base in Africa. Because for the moment, they are in Stuttgart, Germany, because nobody in Africa wanted them. Now they can have their own base in Libya. So the circle is closed. Well, you're right. Again, uh, over two years ago, we covered in the Obama deception that there would be invasions of North Africa because that was the Pentagon plan. Uh, I mean, they hide all of this in plain view. Now they've got all those modern military bases, airfields, water supplies. Look out, Africa, because they're going to start the CIA-funded coups and rebel forces are about to spill into all of the country. And uh, now all of Africa is another globalist battlefield. Pepe Escobar, thank you so much for your amazing insights. Thank insight. you, Alex. Great pleasure. Thanks very much. Great pleasure talking to you.
Well, that was our extended interview with Pepe Escobar. We're going to go to break and come back with more. It's InfoWars Special Report. You don't need me to tell you that humanity is in a deep crisis. Everyone can feel it. We know a tectonic struggle is now taking place against the forces of freedom and those who love darkness, bondage, and enslavement. Yes, my friends, evil is rising. But take heart, for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. Recently, New World Order operative Hillary Clinton admitted they're losing the info war. We are in an information war, and we are losing that war. The globalists are scared. They've overreached. The future of the info war is in your hands. Join PrisonPlanet.tv, download the thousands of special video reports, ebooks, and more, and get them out to everyone you know. Continue to spread the word about the broadcast on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and every other globalist propaganda platform. We are going to use their system against them. The Info War now goes into high gear. Anti-tyranny activist and reporter Luke Radowski confronted the owner of the World Trade Center complex, Larry Silverstein. He questioned him in front of the corporate whore media about why he had ordered the demolition of Building 7. And then he confronted the media and asked them, why haven't you been asking these important questions? Again, this is not one of the Twin Towers. Right. This is a building that fell just moments ago. It had been burning for hours. There's Building 7, 47 stories down to the ground. World Trade Center 7 has been the Achilles heel of the U.S. government's official fable about 9-11. How could a 47-story building collapse at freefall speed into its own footprint? The government does not offer an explanation, as there is nothing relating to World Trade Center 7 in the 9-11 Commission report. Larry Silverstein, owner of the towers, claims he gave the order to pull it, which is an industry term used by the explosive demolition industry. Maybe the smartest thing to do is, is pull it. Uh, and they made that decision to pull, and then we watched the building collapse. And Dan Rather reported seeing the same thing on 9-11. For the third time today, it's reminiscent of those pictures we've all seen too much on television before when a building was deliberately destroyed, destroyed by well-placed dynamite to knock it down. He then backed up that statement when asked years later. But uh, I was reporting live at 9-11, and I... Uh, reported what I saw and tried to describe it as accurately as I know how. Luke Radowski, founder of We Are Change, has confronted WTC7 owner Larry Silverstein on several occasions, and Larry refuses to answer his questions. In America, you made an infamous quote saying, pull it. Now, you later released a press release saying that that was the firefighters outside work tracing in Building 7 on 9-11. It's two questions. If you meant to pull the firefighters out, why didn't you say evacuate the firefighters? And there's also FEMA reports and first responders that I know personally that firefighters were already out that building before you made that statement. So can you please clarify your statement? This is Luke's latest attempt, which is on the heels of the 10th anniversary of the worst false flag attack on American soil. Last time we talked, sir, I asked you if you could address some of the 9-11 conspiracy theories that you were accused of. Uh, sadly, your response has actually invited more of them. I mean, for the record, everybody knows your infamous comments on PBS where you said pull Building 7 uh, on 525 on the day of 9-11. Your official response was that it was the firefighters. My question is, it was pretty clear that you meant the building, and if it was the firefighters, they already are outside the building by 12 because the water lines were broken. Ask the question. And the, the fire chief that you said you spoke to, Fire Chief Negro, denies talking to you on that day of 9-11. Can you answer those questions and address the theories against you? I suggest to everybody's consideration Just one question. that we all look at the thousands of pages of testimony that have been rendered in the many years since 9-11, and let's use today's session for some of this. Are you aware of Thank testimony of bombs in the building before Thank the building collapsed, sir? Are you aware of that testimony? Let's go. Sir, there's testimony go. by Barry Jennings. Sir, you don't, sir, you don't have to touch yeah. me. Uh, yeah. Listen, I, wa I walk away. Right. All I'm asking is a question. I don't, have to, I don't have to be kicked out. I know, but there's other people it's a legitimate questions. question. You don't there's have to people. put your hands on me. But all I'm you saying is, make a scene no, I'm not. I'm here asking. The question was not answered. That's why I have a grievance. Okay. Larry Silverstein was told not to come into work. That's why him, his daughter, and his son never showed up to work on 9-11. He, he put an insurance policy on the buildings 
Reporters, do your job, please. Ask some questions. As you can see, Larry is still not answering his questions. This is Rob Dew reporting for InfoWars.com Special Report. Luke Radowski, founder of We Are Change, asked the question, why don't you do your job? Why don't you ask real questions? That, my friends, is why the mainstream dinosaur media is losing almost all of its viewers, listeners, and readers. Is because the people know they're a bunch of bought and paid for corporate prostitutes. Joining us is Luke Radowski of We Are Change. Luke, great job. You've confronted Larry Silverstein many times over the years. Uh, they threw you out of there, and uh, they certainly looked shook up by you. Oh, they definitely did. I mean, I'm not like the regular prostitutes just asking questions from the press release that they give you. I mean, I personally believe it's the job of a journalist to ask real questions, to be the eyes and ears of the American people, to spur the lazy, to expose corruption. And when you do that, I mean, the same thing happens every time I go out to a major press conference. It's always the same thing. You ask a legitimate question, never get an answer. They duck and dive. Sometimes they even run away. And then they have a manhandler waiting there just to drag you out. And that's what I'm trying to point out to the people online. Why are these questions so hard to answer? And uh, that's what I'm hoping people will get from the videos that I put out there so they could actually find out what's really happening in this world because the journalists aren't doing their jobs. And if they're not, fine. The mainstream media, forget them. We are the new mainstream media. We're going to make them obsolete. We're going to do their job for them. And that's what we're doing here at We Are Change. You're a New Yorker. Uh, you were there on 9-11. Uh, we have Larry Silverstein saying they pulled Building 7, a controlled demolition term. We have the CNN footage. Cops saying, get back, they're bringing it down. We have BBC announcing the building had fallen into its own footprint 25 minutes before. Uh, the list just goes on and on. Then NIST said it didn't fall at free fall speed. Now they've had to admit it did. It's a classical controlled demolition. We've got 1,500 architects and engineers on record now saying this is a cover-up. Yeah, let's not also forget the survivors, the people who lived through 9-11, people like William Rodriguez and Barry Jennings and Kevin McPadden. I mean, those stories of people who survived and lived through those horrible attacks conflict with the official version of the story. I mean, there was a countdown from witnesses from 10 to 0 when Building 7 came down. I mean, everybody was saying, let's go back, they're going to blow up this building. And now the official story that it wasn't blown up, I mean, it doesn't make any sense. It never adds up. And to find out the truth, all you have to do is look at the people who lived through it, the eyewitnesses who survived it. All you have to do is just do a little bit of research. Don't believe anything I say ever. Don't question everything, but just people, just please do your homework. And, you know, I've been here in Washington, D.C. I've been doing other interviews with people on the streets. And sadly, you know, when I'm doing a man on the street interview, I'm showing a, a picture of Snooki, and people know automatically who that is. And then I show them a picture of their representative, their congresswoman. And they don't know who the hell that is. And, and that's sad. But what we're trying to show and highlight is just people go out there and think. It's not dangerous. Think for yourself, people. I mean, we have one life. It's short. And we deserve to know what's really happening. The 10-year anniversary is coming up. And I want to get back into the controlled demolition of the towers in a moment, Luke, and all the harassment you've gone through over the years uh, trying to simply expose it. Uh, but... Looking at the uh, articles that have come out in CNN, Fox News, you name it, where the White House has said no 9-11 first responders are allowed at ground zero. Now, I know in past years, first responders have confronted people and said, you lied about the deadly asbestos dust. Uh, there were controlled demolitions. We want to talk about the countdown we all heard for Building 7. Is that the real reason that 10 years later, uh, that down in that wound in the earth where they've built no new structures where they could hold thousands of people that no first responders are allowed or is there something else involved i mean second uh, first responders have been disrespected 10 for, for 10 years now i mean from the beginning they were denied basic health benefits that were entitled to them by their job not even asking for more things they were asking for workers comp unemployment benefits and they weren't even getting those i mean even when they were getting sick uh the government came out and said they're not they're not getting sick no it's psychological and uh, it, it's just a slap in the face of what they're doing to first responders. They had to fight tooth and nail to get all the proper help and support uh, for, with the James Droga bill. That was a huge uphill battle. And they're just pretty much spitting in the face of the heroes of 9-11. They deserve to be there more than anybody. Uh, and uh, the mistreatment, actually right now, it's not even a surprise. I mean, 
they've been getting disrespected for 10 years now. So this is only a continuation of the policies that have been enacted by the government who uses them for political purposes, but yet then when they need help because they're dying of so many horrible diseases, new diseases that doctors may, never even saw or heard before, they just get denied health benefits. They have to fight for what they were entitled to. And uh, this is no surprise at all, Alex. So bottom, so line, bottom line, the establishment, the establishment wants, wants, to wants to use the heroics uh, of the 9-11 uh, first responders to sell their police state agenda, but they don't actually want the first responders there. Now, Luke, I have three news articles in closing I want to talk to you about. Number one, there's a Daily Mail article dealing with the BBC propaganda piece uh, that came out a few nights ago that demonizes myself and others, and it says, one in seven believe U.S. government staged 9-11 attacks in conspiracy. But I've seen scientific polls in the New York Times where 83% question the official story. Other polls where 60 plus percent uh, on CNN. I know in my own personal life, the majority of people I talk to don't believe the official story. So this itself uh, is a spin. And I wanted to get your take on that before we get into State Department says don't invade the privacy of cleric on CIA kill list. We'll break that down in a moment. But first, uh, what do you think of these poll numbers only claiming that one in seven think the government did it? I mean, polls are very uh, objective. It depends what questions you ask. It, and sometimes, based on the certain question you ask, that's the kind of answer you're going to get. We've seen different polls, but I think many of Americans are supportive of a new not 11 investigation. That's clear that we were lied to. That's clear that people that were responsible for keeping us safe that day failed us. And they did more than that. And we are still yet to find out because of all the documents that they're hiding from us. Uh, FBI documents, the Pentagon pictures, and I could go on and on. Well, the on establishment, and Luke, tries to claim that you're a three-headed monster if you talk about a new investigation. Six of the 10 9-11 commission members have said it's a criminal cover-up. Two so of the three lawyers say it's a criminal cover-up. I mean, right there, uh, several of them called for a new investigation. Exactly, and it was set up to fail from the beginning from the 9-11 commissioners themselves. We don't know the whole truth behind 9-11. There's so many unanswered questions by the victim's family members. There's so many conflicting testimony. There's so much evidence out there that people should definitely look at and need to look at if they care about this country to save this country from the uh, incredible hardships that we are facing because 9-11, it's going to keep affecting us for the next 100 years. It's not going to go away. It's still going to keep affecting us, and that's why we need to find out the truth behind 9-11 and demand, demand all those classified information that's being kept from us public. Luke, the next reports I've got here is the fact that Fox News, CNN, you name it, are being forced to report. Remember last year it came out that Amor al the number three in Al-Qaeda, was a CIA asset and was uh, two weeks after 9-11 at the Pentagon in a secret meeting with the Secretary of the Army. Now media and others have requested the State Department file on Anwar al and have been told they're not going to release it for his privacy, even though he's on a CIA hit list. I mean, right here, you have the hijackers in the news trained at U.S. bases. You have the head of the U.S. embassy in Saudi Arabia saying they were ordered to let him back into the U.S. and told they were U.S. government agents. You have the, the, C, the FBI paying for their houses and credit cards in San Diego. And now it comes out they're protecting Anwar al And in closing, Pepe Escobar, who we interviewed earlier, who's a Asia Times uh, roving global reporter in war zones for a decade, has confirmed that the leader of the rebels is CIA NATO-backed and is Al-Qaeda, and that Libya is being given to Al-Qaeda. They used Al-Qaeda against the Serbs. They used Al-Qaeda against the Russians. Al-Qaeda is just a cutout for the globalists to stage terror. Your view on that, Luke Radowski, in closing. You're definitely right about that. And that's why real journalists need to ask these questions to our elected officials. That's what I did with Joe Lieberman. You can see the video on our YouTube channel. I went up to Joe Lieberman about three times, the head neocon chief himself who supports all, all the wars. And I asked him, how come there's a known terrorist having dinner at the Pentagon that's on the most wanted list? This doesn't make sense. He promised me he would look into it. I had everybody call into his office. I had people write letters. And his official response is that he did get a response and then he can't share it with the people. So that just shows you how much 
evidence how much important things that they're keeping away from us that conflicts with their official fairy tale version of the war on terror, which is really the war on you, the war on the people, the war on our freedom and sovereignty. And that's why they don't want to tell you any of this important information that we deserve. The people of America, we deserve to know the truth behind 9-11. We have to demand it. We have to stand for it. And that's why I'm calling for everybody to be in New York City on 9-11, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and a weekend. I want you there. I want to be in the streets. I want to stand up. I want to convince people. I want to make a difference in this. Perhaps you should perhaps you should have your own event for the 9-11 first responders that aren't included and invite the so-called media there to talk about it. And you've got Adam Gadon, grandson of the head of the ADL, Adam Perlman. That's all staged. I saw an article admitting that four of the five top al-Qaeda guys that are battling to be the new bin Laden were all from the U.S., U.S. intelligence. This is as phony as a $3 bill. This is a uh, secret army used to take over countries, but also menace the West so the system can take our liberty and the TSA can stick their hands down our pants. Luke, how do activists out there join We Are Change? How do they find you on the web? Right now, our website is having trouble, so just look us up on Twitter, on Facebook. Subscribe to our YouTube channel on wearechange.org. I'm not contributing to Adam versus the man anymore, which means I'm going on to bigger and better things. We're going to start a new a website, a new video platform. This is only the beginning. We're getting started here. We're stepping our game up. We're not going away anywhere. And just watch us, subscribe, be there with us, and be the change you want to see in this world. We're going to make history, and I know it. Well, Luke, people can watch the video online. It's in Truth Rising, the 9-11 Chronicles, where the police come over when you're protesting with a permit in front of Building 7. People ought to watch this. And, and they come and they say, we know your backpack's not a bomb. We know your camera's not a gun. We're going to go ahead and say it isn't put you in jail unless you leave. Yep. And then the police grab your camera and say it's a gun. And they give you your camera back. I mean, that's a felony to sit there and call in a fake bomb threat, but they did it. It just shows how scared they are of the truth. If if we were just kooks concerning the fact that 9-11 is an inside job, they would just ignore us. They wouldn't try yep. to demonize us. But the good Why news is... Dragged out of events for asking a simple question that never got answered. Yes, they... They are scared to death of it. If we were just kooks, they wouldn't spend all this time trying to debunk us. But I love the debunking because it makes people question and then look at the facts and learn the truth. Luke Radowski of We Are Change, thank you so much for talking to us tonight. Thanks for having me. Luke Radowski, ladies and gentlemen, defending liberty, resisting tyranny. Well, that's it for this edition of InfoWars Special Report. Don't forget we premiere the nightly news coming up September 1st, 7 p.m., right here at PrisonPlanet.tv and InfoWars.com. I'm Alex Jones signing off. Great job with the crew. We'll see you all out there on the front lines of the InfoWars.